the two most important institutions I would say uh, in the world are family and church and the two are profoundly interrelated as I want us to see in this uh, particular uh, talk to many in the world including many Christians many Catholics yes of course family family is important but not so much the church there are many Catholics who are lapsed who are not active in living out their faith life in the uh, as, as, as Christians as Catholics and then on the other hand there are those who yes for the church the importance of the church but might actually neglect family in all of these years of MFC I've met I've, I've come up with uh, even chapter servants who were uh, serving as uh, lay ministers in the parishes but were into extramarital infidelity so what what we need to see is that the family the home is a church it is the smallest church it is an ecclesial community and the church is a family so the, the, the two are so intertwined, interconnected, overlapping, and uh, mutually supportive. And all of this happens in accordance with God's plan. Uh, let's take a quick look at the family according to God's plan from the very beginning, from the book of Genesis. And as we've seen all of these years, what the enemy tries to do is to destroy God's plan. Unfortunately, he succeeded in bringing down our first parents and they lost uh, paradise, Eden. Uh, but the enemy continues to assault everything that is of God, especially the more specific aspects of family and community life that God put together. For example, in Genesis 1 verse 27, God created us male and female. Now, as you know, there are so many different genders, LGBTQI+, and so on and so forth. Uh, marriage is supposed to be union between male and female, the man and a, a woman, but now you have same-sex unions. In Genesis 2, verse 24, God made man and woman one flesh. It's a mystery. They become a new unity. Prior to that, okay, you're you and I'm, I'm me. And uh, when we marry sacramentally, we become one flesh. But what's, what does the world do, do today? There's massive uh, numbers of divorces, of uh, separation, of uh, men and women who might be living together apart from sacramental marriage. And then in Genesis 1 verse 28, our first, par first parents are told, and so we are told, go forth to be fruitful and to multiply. This is the uh, aspect of marriage that is about uh, conception, about procreation. It is bringing people into the world it is in effect being like co-creators with god and god gives us that privilege and again that's a great mystery but what do we have today today you have contraception to prevent pregnancy you have abortion in case pregnancy happens and the the, the woman or the couple do not uh, want it you have sterilization to actually remove the the property of a man or a woman to be able to procreate so all of these things very widespread in the world today contrary to the very design and plan of god so we see that the family is under attack and the intent of the evil one is to destroy the very foundations according to god's will and unfortunately, brothers and sisters, the enemy is succeeding. 
when we see all of these massive diabolical evils happening all around us in the assault on family and life, we see that the enemy is succeeding. Too many broken homes, too many separations, uh, live-ins, uh, unwanted children. Why, why, why are these so? The, the purposes of God are no longer being lived out. For example, sex is today just for pleasure. When certainly God put pleasure into that because he, he loves us so much, so you enjoy the sexual act, but it is within the context of marriage and it is intended for procreation. But now it's just sex. And make sure that, you know, uh, don't get, get the, the woman pregnant. Marriage. Marriage is a divine institution. And uh, marriage is the foundation for a strong and stable society. But today, marriage is no longer needed. Uh, man and a woman might just uh, live in. And if they do get married, well, uh, they don't like each other anymore, then they can always get divorced. How about children? Again, children are part of the design of, of God. But today, many do not want children. Uh, husband and wife, they might fall in love, they do get married, but they don't want children because children are, say, are a bother. It, it impedes their uh, social mobility, their career advancement. Uh, and so they, they find that there's still a need to... Uh, to care for someone or something uh, within the context of their being together, just the two of them. So what do they have? They have pets. Might be a cat, it might be a dog, it might be a turtle, or whatever else it might be, but not a child. Because a child is a bother for them. Then how about family? Well, family today has been redefined. Family used to mean a man and a woman having children. But today, you can have a gay couple, two men or two women, who would adopt a child. And they say that that is family. So, the very secular society of today is trying to eliminate all of this. All uh, the wonderful realities and truths that God in His great wisdom uh, put together and now people are just living according to the dictates of of man of uh, the the human mind and the human desire but marriage family these are not a social construct yes they're important for society according to the design of god but it, these are not just human institutions that humanity can discard okay it's useful before now it's no longer useful uh, now we have something else uh, that is that is new no it it comes from god it is god's work and because it is god's work then as we are always seeing the enemy who is also at work is opposing the very work of god he seeks to destroy whatever is of god this is what we call spiritual warfare. The enemy is warring on marriage, on family, on life. And this is the spiritual war happening in the heavens and on earth between God and uh, Satan, between the forces of good and the forces of, of uh, evil. So, we, we, we actually read this uh, familiar verse to all of us in Ephesians 6 verse 12. Paul says, For our struggle is not with flesh and blood, but with the principalities, with the powers, with the world rulers of the present darkness, with the evil spirits in the heavens. The error of people today, uh, people who uh, want to do something about what they see is wrong in the world, is not to see that basically it is a spiritual war. 
so they see all of these things that are wrong and they try to okay how can we make this better uh, better instruction pre cana before a couple is uh, married or better um, uh, ways by which uh, parents are are enabled to raise their children uh, or maybe in society uh, a national effort to give benefits to those who are married and who have children and all of those are, are good but unless we realize that at the heart of all of this all of these challenges is spiritual war then we will never really be, be able to address and do something uh, to overturn all of these challenges and so Paul also says in Ephesians in the verse before 6 verse 11 put on the armor of God so that you may be able to stand firm against the tactics of the devil so it is a spiritual war that we are engaged in and because of that we need to look at the spirituality of the family again it's not just a social construct uh, it is uh, the very divine work of God. So we look at the spiritual dimension of what God put together. The family is a basic unit of the church. It is the smallest ecclesial community. It is church. The family, the home, is church. The members of the family are disciples individually and they are called to holiness you know this is not just when we talk about Christian matters or when we go to church no in our day-to-day -day life as members of the family we are supposed to be disciples of the Lord and we are to grow in uh, holiness then the the family the home is the place where the spirit and God's people dwell not just people not just you and I and our loved ones but the very spirit of God ought to be dwelling in our homes and so the the home is to be a center of Christian family life and people are supposed to experience love unity uh, peace uh, solidarity all the Christian virtues yeah. then what else the home is a place for teaching children and training future generations of Christians this shouldn't just happen in schools even in Catholic schools there are many parents who well they hardly know really anything about uh, uh, how to uh, instruct their children in the Lord. They don't know the, the Bible, so they, they look to the, the, the school. That's where you learn. That's where, where you become a good uh, Catholic. Uh, but yes, it can be supplemented by the school, but most especially in the home, by the parents, training the future generations. And this faith is passed on from generation to generation until the Lord returns. And it's important to have the example of parents. Children, from the time that they're very young, see the example of parents. Even when they do not quite understand, yes, yet, why does my mother, why does my father act in this way? But they're seeing that. And so we need to exemplify Christian virtues as parents. And there has to be diligent teaching about God and the scriptures. You know, we, we always say, which is a reality, that uh, unfortunately Catholics do not know the Bible. But that cannot be. It should not be. You know, we need to know the Word of God. Even with our ancestors in the faith, the uh, Israelites, they stress so much the importance of the Scriptures. We read in Deuteronomy 6 verses 4 to 9. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. 
Therefore, you shall love the Lord your God with your whole heart, with your whole being, and with your whole strength. It's called the Shema. It's the very center of uh, the, the scriptures, of the way by which the people of God, the Israelites, are to act. And when Jesus talked about the greatest of the commandments, this is what he pointed to. No, the first and greatest commandment. Then it goes on, verse 6. Take to heart these words which I command you today. Take to heart. Don't just hear no, or even listen, but allow it to move from your head to your heart. And people have said that that's the longest distance, from the head to the heart. No? But take it to heart. And then, what do should parents do in verse 7? Keep repeating them to your children. Repeat them over and over. And through life, you hear the Word of God. You read, you study the Word of God. Recite them when you are at home and when you are away. When you lie down and when you get up. Bind them on your arm as a sign and let them be as a pendant on your forehead. You can still see Orthodox Jews in uh, Israel, the ones who are dressed in black and have this uh, uh, top hat. And at times on uh, certain occasions, they have something on their forehead. It's a small box you know, tied around their head or on their arm, a small box. And this is what it is. It contains this, the Shema, in that small box. And so they literally follow this instruction of God. Bind them on your arm as a sign. Let them be a pendant on your forehead. Verse 9. Write them on the doorposts of your houses and on your gates. So even the, the, the physical aspects of our home. So you know you, you, you have something posted on the wall which is the word of God. It reminds you about some crucial and critical uh, aspects of the Word of God that are so appropriate for the home or for the, the family. So it's a, the home is a place for teaching and training. Finally, the home is a base for evangelization. So it's not just for the people who live in their homes. It's for people outside. It's so that the people who live in the home can be properly trained, grow in holiness, be authentic disciples of Christ, and then go out. And we know that our church is missionary. The reason why Jesus instituted this church is to continue to carry on with his divine work. And that means to do mission. So, God's plan is that the family would be the basic unit of society. And how the children are raised, what values they develop, happens in the family and it influences how they act in society. They are formed for a long, long time, uh, 20 years in, in the home. For Jesus, it was 30 years. And then they go out into society and what they have been formed with has become a part of them, a very natural part of them. John Paul II had said that uh, the future of humanity passes by way of the family. And that's true. Being the basic unit of society. And that's why the enemy seeks to destroy the family. The enemy wants to destroy God's creation. And he hates so much the creatures such as you and I that are made in the image and likeness of God. And so what does the enemy do? What does he cause to happen in the world? You have war, you have poverty, you have uh, pollution, uh, you have many uh, uh, people, uh, homeless people, and people that have left their countries but are roaming around seeking the place uh, where they can, they can live, where they can, they can thrive. But basically, the way that the enemy works is to destroy the family. Because when you destroy the basic institution, everything else will quickly collapse. And that's what we're really seeing already in society in the world today. 
Now, just as the family is a small church, the family is a church, so also the church is a large family. So the family is a church, the church is a family. The church is a family of families. The church, as we know, was established by the Spirit of God on the day of uh, Pentecost. And uh, the, the, uh, as, as children of God, we look to God, of course, as our uh, Father, you know, Jesus as our uh, brother. We are the people of God as family and as church. And we, as Christians, are called to be the salt of the earth and the light to the world just as Jesus was and is. And so the, the, the church ensures the existence of the kingdom of God in the world. And the more that uh, there are who are uh, members of the church, uh, hopefully of the one true authentic church, then uh, the greater the influence on uh, the, the world. We can learn what are crucial for uh, the family actually by what the Spirit established on Pentecost. So remember, family is church, church is family. On the day of Pentecost, the Spirit came down upon the disciples and established the church. So what we're going to read from Acts 2 uh, starting from verse 42 onwards, relates to church, to the community, to the body of Christ, to the disciples, to the people of God. But because the family is church and the church is family, uh, we can also learn what are crucial for the family from uh, what, what the Spirit established on the day of Pentecost. So we take a look at uh, Acts 2. Uh, what are the spiritual and social dimensions of family uh, spirituality? So first of all, Acts 2 verse 42. They devoted themselves to the teaching of the apostles. So what is important is teaching. Formation. And uh, formation that is in accordance with the Magisterium. We have to say that because the problem today, uh, there is already a lack of clear and correct teaching. Oftentimes, parents who are not renewed in Christ might not really know. Uh, they might not even really know their, their, their faith. But also, even among the pastors of the church, unfortunately, there is wrong teaching, false uh, teaching. So, there needs to be teaching, there needs to be formation that is in accordance with the actual teachings of Christ in the magisterium of the church. So the parents themselves, they need to be taught, and there are many ways by which uh, that, can, that can happen, Th then they act as uh, teachers of their children. And if they do not do this, their children will be taught by their peers, by their classmates, by their, uh, by the internet, and you know it's good if, if their peers and classmates are uh, members of uh, MFC youth or MFC singles, and hopefully they teach each other the uh, right ways of God. But oftentimes that would not be the case, even in Catholic schools. And then of course there's the all pervasive internet, and what do uh, uh, children learn there the ways of the world. Still in verse 42, they devoted themselves to the communal life. Communal life, life together. And of course, that's church. All of us together. But more so, the family, because we actually physically live together in a structure that is called a home. Not a house. 
Not a boarding house. It's not a place where people just physically live, but they really have nothing to do with each other. They have their own meal times and they're locked up in their rooms or even the few times that they're together during a meal and they're all uh, looking at their iPhones. No. no, it's not a boarding house. It is a place where the people of God really come together and they interact and they experience love for one another. There, there is, there is a communication. And so they, this builds up the bond among them. There is interaction so that they help uh, one another grow in the Lord. And there's even uh, rest and recreation. So they enjoy each other's company. Okay, still in verse 42. They devoted themselves to the breaking of the bread. And we understand the breaking of the bread for, for uh, here as we read it here. Uh, the uh, community of disciples would come together. They eat their meals together. And of course, that's what uh, family members ought to do. You know? And, and you know, it's very challenging today in the family because the, the parents and children are uh, have their own involvements. Uh, so perhaps the only real time when they can come together physically, not just say hi, you know, they're, they're all in the home and hi when they meet each other, uh, uh, in, in the sala, but the time they can really spend some time together is during meal times. So, so that that is important, the breaking of the bread. But as far as the church is concerned, that is also the Eucharist, where we partake of the Eucharistic bread. And every family should be united to the faith of the church that is basically celebrated on Sunday. Unfortunately, today there are many Catholics who no longer go to regularly Sunday Mass. And there have been recent studies that because of the uh, pandemic where people were not actually going to church now that uh, the churches are being opened, but like what well, statistics said, 25% of Catholics who used to go to church now no longer go to church. It's very unfortunate. This cannot be. Because that, that Eucharistic bread, that food is crucial to life. No, we would never think in terms of uh, I'm, I'm not going to eat uh, the, the meal, the physical meal. No. But as a spiritual people, the Eucharistic bread is very, very crucial to us. And it provides us with the spiritual strength that we need in life. Okay, still on verse 42. They devoted themselves to the prayers. And we need to pray. We pray without ceasing, 24-7. We're talking about daily personal prayer and reading, meditating on uh, the Word of God. Uh, and, and when uh, Paul tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 17, pray without ceasing, what does that mean? Uh, we no longer eat, we no longer sleep, we no longer go to work. No, it just means being uh, really conscious that you have a relationship with God. Prayer is basically about a relationship. It's not just asking God for things or when you have problems. So when you don't have problems, as many people do, when they have a big problem, they are there praying so hard, but when the problem passes, they're no longer praying so intently. No, it's not just that. It is a relationship to build up that relationship. And so 24-7, uh, we are conscious that we are a people of God that we have that relationship and that we uh, want to grow in that relationship and to learn God's uh, ways. In verse 44, all who believed were together and had all things in common. Now, you can easily see how that is true in a family. When a man and a woman get married, they become one, not just one uh, sacramentally or as a mystery or even relating to, uh, to to sex but you know they have everything in common they, their only interest uh, before it was me for me you for you but now it is for the, 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 the family and so for them it is a very natural thing to share because this is what happened with the first Christian community. 
because they held everything in common, they understood themselves to be stewards. Everything belonged to God and was just entrusted to them. And so they thought in terms not just of using it for themselves, but for uh, the good of all, especially for the poor. And so this is something that should happen very, very naturally in the family. Sharing, stewardship, with the goal of everyone to together make it to heaven. <clears throat> Verse 45. They would sell their property and possessions and divide them among all according to each one's needs. So the church cared for the needs of, the, of others. They understood that they were their brother's keepers. Now again, this is what ought to happen in the family. And in the family, it is much more natural because we really are related by blood. We really are brothers. We really have the same interests living in the same home. And we want to care for one another. And if, if things are going well with us, but not with my brother or with my sister, and I see him or her miserable, that affects me. And I don't want that to be. If I'm joyful, I want everyone else to be joyful as well. So this, this uh, sharing, this caring for others ought to happen in the church, but is such a natural in the family. And we say, uh, as far as stewardship is concerned, less for self, more for others, enough for all. And this calls for for self-denial, it calls for uh, self-sacrifice. But when people have this mindset and they're willing to share, oftentimes even at the sacrifice of their own personal well-being, just like the uh, story of the widow's might, where she gave everything that she had to live on. And, and when this happens, then no one will be in need. And that actually we've been saying is the solution to poverty in the world. It is not to make rich peop uh, poor people rich. It is actually that poor people have enough of the world's goods that their basic needs are met. Food, clothing, shelter, and whatever else is, uh, is uh, needed. And they live with the dignity of being a child of God. Verse 46. Every day, they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple area. So the church came together. We as church today come together at least every Sunday. But that time, they did it every day. They came together. Now again, this is something that is natural in the home. But we need to consciously meet together in the temple area. The temple is our home. And what do you do in the temple? What do you do in the church? You pray. You look to spiritual things. You're not just there for a meal. You're not just there to sleep well. Uh, you're not just there to uh, enjoy each other's company. All of that is certainly part uh, of it. But we meet together in the temple area. So family prayer is important. We need to have family prayer. Bible study, individually, as a couple, as a family, uh, using the liturgical Bible study methodology, but get into the Word of God. Christian discussion is also important and very helpful. And it can happen in the uh, normal day-to-day -day, uh, activities, such as having a meal. Uh, instead of just talking about anything and everything, uh, the latest news, you can talk about spiritual matters and have a Christian discussion. What else? Still in verse 46. They met together in the temple area and they devoted themselves to the breaking of the bread in their homes. So, uh, they eat together. And we as family, we do have our meals together. And again, the challenge today with uh, today's uh, lifestyle, especially in the Western world, but so much more in many other parts of the world, uh, there are hardly any uh, family interaction. 
the father or maybe both father and mother would be off to work. Maybe not so much now that we are quarantined, still quarantined for some of us. But uh, oftentimes they're off to work. Uh, the children are off to school and there's not much that uh, of family interaction. And then when they're all together in the evening, uh, they're all at their gadgets. But there will always be time. As I mentioned earlier, at least meal time, dinner time, come together and break bread uh, together. Then, of course, when you have the time, uh, social gatherings, you can do that outside of the ho home. Every once in a while, you go off to the mall, uh, go to a nice, uh, simple uh, restaurant, have your family meal there. But you are interacting. You're breaking bread together. Still in verse 46, they ate their meals with exultation, uh, with exultation. They were joyful because they were together with brothers and sisters in the Lord. And as, as uh, Paul told the uh, Philippians, Philippians 4 verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. I shall say it again. Rejoice. This is something that ought to be very natural to Christians. Our joy is in Christ. And that means that uh, that joy remains despite trials. In fact, because of trials. Because we know that we have a God that we can cling to, that we can turn to, who would help us in our greatest needs. And that would fill us with joy in the world. You know, you're on your own. You're on your uh, own devices. And, and uh, if you run out of those, then you can't do anything anymore. But as Christians, we know the Lord is always there. And so even as we deny ourselves, even as we embrace our crosses, we know that we will always have joy. And, and this was the way it was with Jesus. He looked to the joy that was there after his suffering. Still in verse 46, they had sincerity of uh, heart. This this. Uh, is, is a basic uh, Christian trait. We need to be sincere. We need to be truthful. We need to be faithful. We need to be caring. We need to be looking to how we can serve uh, others. We look to uh, and have a desire in our heart to build one another up in love. This comes out of the sincerity of our heart. Verse 47. Praising God. Their focus was always on the Lord. And we today, as members of the family in the home, we are Christ-centered. We have our prayers, we have our worship, and our hearts need to be filled with gratitude always. Give thanks to the Lord in all circumstances. Not only when things are going well and things are good, but even when things seem not to be so good. Because God is good. God is always good. And so we give thanks always. Still verse 47. Praising God and enjoying favor with all the people. This happens in the home. This happens outside. This is first of all about the silent witness of a holy life. And you know, fellow Catholics ought to be able to see that in church when, when there's some interaction or some uh, church activity or they see you serving, they, they should be able to say, now that is a holy woman. That is a holy man. By the silent witness of our lives in Christ. And unfortunately today, what we have is the bad witness of broken families, Christian families, Catholic families. And that's a bad witness. And there are those who, especially in today's world, uh, where marriage is no longer all that important as it was before, they look at divorce and broken marriages and say, well, you know, if it's just going to be that way, why, why get married at all? We just live in together. So... It is a bad witness. But the witness of our lives 
in marriage, in family, uh, should be such that we enjoy favor with all the people. And then the last part of verse 47. And every day the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. And so they were not just focused on themselves, on helping one another, on loving one another, caring for one another, good as that is, but they sought to expand the church. They did evangelization. They proclaimed the gospel of salvation in uh, Jesus. And today, as members of the family, we do that even in our day-to-day -day lives. That's why we say everyone can be an evangelizer. It just does not mean to say you are the missionary who goes off to another country or you are the one who goes off to uh, an activity and to actually preach the gospel. But in your day-to-day -day circumstances of life, you live as a Christian, you give, you show forth the silent witness of a holy life. And of course, if you're able to, to share something about the Christian faith, you do that. So this can happen in your workplace. This can happen in your school. This can happen in your subdivision. In any place, the Lord will always give the opportunity for you to witness to uh, Him. What should be in our heart is to desire salvation for all. Because Jesus came, suffered a horrible death in order to win for us our salvation. And then He sends us forth. Go and proclaim the gospel. And that's what we need to do. And that ought to be in our heart. We see so many people who are lost, who are in darkness, and we want to do whatever we can because we desire the very salvation that we are already experiencing. We want them to experience that as well. So we evangelize. So, brothers and sisters, what is needed, families that are being formed according to the mind of God. And that means families that are being church. We need to be evangelized. We need to, to live the gospel. Uh, otherwise, life becomes dysfunctional. When our lives, outside certainly, but uh, especially in the home, are not lived according to the ways of, of God, then the home becomes full of strife. There is no peace. There is a lack of love. There's uh, not much caring and, and sharing. And because of that, children turn away from uh, the faith. <coughs> so, uh, we need to be church. We do the work of uh, evangelization within the family, outside the family. We know that the family is uh, under attack by uh, evil forces. And, and uh, we, we, we read in 1 Peter 5, verse 8, Be sober and vigilant. Your opponent, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. We are under attack by evil forces. We are in spiritual war. And what does the devil want to do? To break up families. And by doing so, he succeeds in destroying societies and nations and, and, and the world. And we need to realize that a particular target of the work of the evil one is the Catholic Church. Why? Because it's the one true church established by God in order to establish the presence, His presence in the world, to build the kingdom of God, to proclaim the gospel of salvation to, to all. And uh, this church can only be, uh, is, is the, uh, today is the only really strong institution that is there to defend faith, family, and life. And that too is our calling. Individually, as families, as a community, the defense of faith, family, and life. Now, tragically, uh, the, the enemy is already also within the church. And that's a tragic thing, but that, that's something that we try to, to, to face. But we need to know, how should the church be? How should the family be? And so in the last uh, uh, decade or so, 
uh, there has been a call to the church to do the work of the uh, new evangelization, especially to reach out to the many lapsed uh, Catholics. And essential is to restore them to Christ, but also to bring about family renewal. New evangelization for the church, and more specifically, renewal within the family. Benedict XVI has said that the, the new evangelization is inseparable from the Christian family. And he said that the new evangelization depends largely on the domestic church. So, family and church, church and family. And the family it starts with personal renewal, my own relationship with Christ, and then the spouses as a new reality, as a, as a mystery, the relationship that is like Christ and his church, that's the relationship of husband and wife. And then from the parents to the children, so that all within the home or within the family will meet Christ. And the home becomes a vibrant church so that everyone lives Christ. And then both family and church going forth as a base to share Christ. This is God's design. This is what we, is, is so important for us uh, to, to see. The Christian family is a blessed ecclesial community. The Christian home is a blessed place. Why? Because it's where God's people live. The people of God, formed by Him, made in His image and likeness, growing to be like Him, growing in holiness, that's where they live. And so the, the family, the home, is a blessed place. And the home is a place where godly virtues and values are taught, are shared, are experienced. So the most important uh, place of formation for the people of God. And it happens from the time of birth. From the time that the baby is cared for. And as that baby is growing, you know, experiencing the love and learning the values, Christian values in the home. The home is blessed because it's a, a haven of serenity we experience the very peace of christ shalom where relationships are in right order with one another the home is is a wellspring of of love love springing forth from our hearts and and touching the lives of everyone in the home the home is a bastion of holiness we grow in holiness unto the Lord. The home is a refuge from a sinful world. We need to be out there in the world and uh, we, we are going to be dirtied, uh, tempted, sometimes even fall, but we get right back to the home, that blessed place, that consecrated place, and know that we come back to a refuge where we can be refreshed, we can be uh, renewed. And of course, the Christian home is a place where Jesus himself dwells. Imagine that, brothers and sisters. We, we don't see the Lord, we don't see the Holy Spirit, but Jesus dwells not only in our hearts, but in our homes. And he's the one who's privy to every conversation, every act of love or non-love, <laughs> every good thing and bad thing that, that we do, Jesus is there. Just think of whoever, some important person, maybe your, your, your parent, maybe your, your dearest friend who thinks so highly of you. What if they were there in the home? You, 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 you would act properly. You would not think of, of letting bad speech come out of your mouth. Or, or doing something that is simply wrong. But Jesus is always there. And if we only realize that, it would help us to say and to do what is right and avoid what is 
what is wrong. Now, the home, being a church where Jesus dwells, the home is a sacred place. And so, it should not contain any object or material that does not honor the presence of the Lord. Can you imagine a, your parish church having a large picture there, a pornographic picture? Unthinkable. It cannot be. But after having said that, what do we see in some of our parish churches today? The LGBT flag, sometimes very prominent in front of the altar. But being active LGBT is a serious wrong. It is diabolical. It is contrary to the very design of, of, of God. And you put that in this holy temple. What evil is that? But there are many, including pastors, that don't realize that. They celebrate it. And, and, but th th there should not... Yeah. Our, the, the church and our church, our home, because it is a small church, should not contain any such object or material. No girly magazines, no, no uh, bad pictures on, on the wall. Uh, none of that kind of thing. Further, the walls of our home should not hold unrighteous anger, unforgiveness, selfishness, contentiousness, disunity, or hatred. This is a holy place. It is a sacred place. And there is nothing of those things you know, that should be in the home. Now, it might happen. Suddenly, uh, someone says something and you flare up. So there's that anger. But you quickly recognize it. You repent. You ask for forgiveness. And your relationships are stored. But this, this, these things, uh, these sins, uh, should not be within the walls of a Christian home. Rather, the, the Christian home should be a place of warmth, of love, of reconciliation, of joy of peace. It's a very unique place. You cannot find that in any other place in the world. Certainly not in the school, not in the hospital, not in the uh, corporate office, no. not in any of those. But it, this, this, this virtues ought to be in the Christian home, especially in the Christian home. These virtues are are nurtured, are lived out, are, are shared. And everything in the Christian home should give honor and glory to God. So, brothers and sisters, the, the, the light of Christ shines forth from the home. And the people of God in the home, parents and children, go forth from their home into the world to bring that light into the lives and homes of many others. So, family is church. Church is family. Both have the same spirit of God in them. Both have the same mission, divine mission to proclaim Christ. Both are crucial to the very life of the world. And each strengthen the other. You have strong families, you, you make up the church, it becomes a strong church. But the church herself, as she is called, with her pastors, with her ministers, with her uh, teachers, continue to support the individual families. And indeed, it is a family of families. And you have the laity in the home, you have the clergy uh, in the church, and together they form the people of God. They have their particular functions, but all are called to the very ministry of Christ by virtue of baptism. They are to be priest, prophet, and king. They are part of the one church. And 
Uh, clergy, of course, they have their own families. They no longer live uh, with their, within their homes. No, they've left that for their higher calling. No, but laity and clergy together, according to the very plan of God. So, brothers and sisters, just as we see very clearly how we are to act as a family, I hope we see uh, very clearly, but it is something much more natural. This is family. This is where I, I, I live in this home day to day with the people who are here. So just as we act as family, we do too as well as church. And that's why it is so important for us to protect the church of which we are part. In the early years of our ministry, uh, uh, we were looking basically to to family renewal. In fact, at the start, just to couples, and then that expanded to the rest of the family, but basically family renewal. But in the last decade or so, we saw that they mentioned uh, that we needed to be a servant to the church and a servant of the church. And we cannot just look at our family. We cannot just say, well, my family is okay. And uh, whatever is happening there with other families or uh, in the world and with the church, uh, well, that's that's them. But I take care of my family and I'm secure. No, it cannot just be that. We take care of our family, but we also look to the strength and security of our church. Family is church. Church is family. The two are uh, interactive, interrelate, interrelated, and 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 uh, bless one another. And so even today. When we see great challenges in our church, not just that the families are no longer there, many families are no longer there, but even that the enemy is there within, we need to, to address that as well. We, we don't say, well, I'm taking care of my, my family, I'm a lay person, so uh, that is my particular calling, but what's happening there with, with the clerics or even the hierarchs, well, that's no longer my concern. No, it is our concern. Because family is church, church is family. And we want our church to be strong so that our families will continue to be strong. So we see all of this and we see God's work, God's son is the same. Even what happened on the day of Pentecost, what happened to the first Christian community is what ought to happen uh, in that small Christian community, which is the family. In that smallest uh, church, which is the home. Amen. Praise be to God.